1807, an act of Congress gave the city of New Orleans title to a strip of land that would become known as Esplanade Avenue, tooted as one of the most handsomest streets in Nouvelle Orleans. It begins in the French Quarter at the bank of the Mississippi River, stretching roughly three miles all the way to City Park, with its great width connecting to Bayou Road, the city's oldest street. Bayou Road served as a Native American trade route that connected the river with Bayou St. John, Lake Pontchartrain, and the Gulf of Mexico. This was one of the first pathways Native Americans traveled while guiding French explorers through the swampy waters at the end of the 17th century. Esplanade Avenue, one of the most prestigious neighborhoods with the largest and most impressive historical buildings in the nation. But Esplanade Avenue, oldest section from Decatur to Rampart Street, holds some of the city's darkest and most horrific memories. This plaque on the lakeside corner of Esplanade and Charters tells the story of what once stood here. A tangled site of slave pen, jail houses, and private cells that housed enslaved humans before being sold, making it one of the most active slave trading sites from 1820 to 1862. In 1829, public health concerns with overcrowding and horrid conditions of French Quarter slave pens cited legal actions taken for the enslaved to be moved out of the French Quarters. The plaque on the riverside tells the complicated tale of Solomon Northrup, a free African-American man and landowner from New York who was kidnapped and held in one of those pens before being sold into slavery in 1841. For 12 years he was enslaved working on plantations in the Red River region of Louisiana. But Martha fought in the courts and obtained his freedom and in 1853 he authored his memoir, 12 Years a Slave. On the corner of Royal and Esplanade was one of the headquarters of the largest slave trading businesses in the United States. In 1833, the slave trading firm of Franklin and Armfield was buying thousands of enslaved people a year out of the mid-Atlantic states and selling them in Louisiana. By 1841, Franklin left slave trading and devoted his energy to real estate. He purchased six plantations in Louisiana, Bellevue, Killarney, Lac Lamont, Angola, Longo, and Palola. After his death in 1846, his widow sold the six plantations to the state of Louisiana. In 1901, they were converted and currently house the Louisiana State Penitentiary, Angola, the largest maximum security prison in the United States. Franklin Estate was worth over $750,000, nearly $24 billion in today's money. The seeds of those dollars are still firmly planted, rooted in the soil of our city and our state. I watched Mama Dear. I watched Mama Dear take a few cups of cornmeal, a half gallon of milk, and a couple of eggs and feed her entire family. I watched both my grandmothers take the bitterness of divorce and turn it into some of the sweetest homemade cakes you've ever tasted. I watched my own mother take an unplanned teenage pregnancy and years of abuse and ridicule and turn into over 30 years of marriage, a career in education, and an award-winning poet for a daughter. See, I am from a long line of women. Women who had to take life's harshest ingredients and turn them into something worth licking your plates for. Louisiana women whose palms are laced with wrinkles and stardust, who weave miracles from misfortune. See, you can call them women, call them mothers, call them alchemists, even call them magicians, but whatever you call them, just make sure you call them ma'am or missus because they are the type of women who demand respect. No hand on hip or roll of neck to keep you in check. Nah, my mama and mama dear, they the type of women whose eyes say everything their mouths never need to. See, the women in my family, they inhale life's pollution 
and exhale gospel. They are walking, talking hymnals, perfect verses of chestnut skin and big bones set over organs and strong heartbeats, all testimony and healing, all holy and how I got over. See, the women in my family, they be bridges over troubled waters. Beautiful examples of how to take life's storms and turn them into baptisms in some days. I don't feel worthy of this kind of salvation. For I know I have indeed been saved by their blood, sweat, and tears. Some days I look at them and those who came before me and I wonder if I am doing such a legacy, any justice, oh, what a cross to bear. Cause see this world, this world will try to make you forget the strength in your own spine. Even when it's in your DNA to bend and never break. Even after you give and give and give and never take anything for yourself. To always be seen as savior, but never as angel. That's why we've learned to take the scars on our shoulders and carve out our own wings. Which is to say, we don't need the world to tell us we fly. Although it would be a nice gesture, well-deserved recognition, but thankfully, thankfully our mamas and Medeas, they taught us how to be our own tambourines, which is to say, they taught us how to shake, shake, shake the devil off our backs and Holy Ghost dance all over his neck. See, their ancestors taught them that. These were the things that could not be drowned in the Atlantic Ocean, and for them we say, hallelujah. For all those who came before us, we say, thank you, God. For I am from a long line of women. Women who had to turn classrooms and kitchens into pulpits. The type of women who have taught me that when your life, your life becomes a sermon that don't nobody else want to hear. Sometimes, sometimes you got to be your own amen. Amen. Amen.